Let's have a look at this 2017 CIE paper two, that's AS, that's AS content, and this is version three of the paper. Question one, two forces with magnitudes five and 12 newtons act on the same point on an object. Calculate the magnitude of the resultant force R for the forces acting in opposite directions. Well, if we have 12 acting in one, five on the other, 12 take away five is the resultant. So it's gonna be seven at right angles to each other. Well, we have 12, we have five to find out the resultant, which is there. We need to do Pythagoras, so that's root of 12 squared plus five squared. So that's root 144 plus 25. And that gives us a nice round number of 13 newtons. An object X rests on a smooth horizontal surface. Two horizontal forces act on X as shown in figure 1.1. Force of 55 is applied to the right. Force of 80 newtons is applied at an angle of 115 degrees to the direction of the 55 newton force. Okay, what are we being asked to find out then? Use the resolution of forces or scale diagram to show the magnitude of the resultant force acting on X is 65 newtons. Okay, so we have 55 newtons in that direction. And ultimately we have 18 newtons going down here. And this angle between them is gonna be 180 minus 115. So that gives us 65 degrees. Okay, now if we want to combine two forces that aren't at right angles, we need to first of all resolve them into forces that are at right angles. So first of all, let's resolve this 18 newtons into a vertical force. So if we're turning away from the 65 degrees, this is gonna end up being 1865. If you don't know how I got the sign and times, go and have a look at my easy vectors trick video. The component going this way is going to be 18 cos 65 but then we have to add on the 55 newtons as well. Let's actually find out what these numbers are. That gives us 62.6 newtons. But then we have this 18 sine 65, that gives us 16.3 newtons. And then we just wanna find the resultant, and that's just gonna be Pythagoras. So let's square that, plus that 62.5 squared, square root of all of that, and lo and behold, we end up with 65. Determine the angle between the resultant force and the 55 Newton force. Okay, so we're trying to find this angle here. So if this is a right angle triangle, we can use either sine, cos, or tan because we know all three sides of the triangle. Let's use tan, seeing that that's the opposite and adjacent here. In order to find out the angle, we do the inverse tan, that's 16.3 divided by 62.6, that gives us 15 degrees. Third force of 80 newtons is now applied to X in the opposite direction to the resultant force in B. So we're talking about a force going back up there with 80 newtons. The mass of X is 2.7 kilograms. Calculate the magnitude of the acceleration of X. Well, if we have 65 pulling down that way, 80, the overall force is going to be 80 minus 65. So it's going to be 15 newtons. We know that that is equals to MA according to Newton's second law. So that means that acceleration is going to be 15 divided by mass. We end up with 5.6, 5.5 recurring, so that's 5.6 meters per second squared. Question two, state Newton's second law of motion. Now we know that the bog standard equation for Newton's second law is F equals MA, but we know that in acceleration, that is change in speed over time. And if we do change in MV over time, that means that force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. That is the proper version of Newton's second law. F equals MA is true, but only if we have a constant mass. B, constant resultant force acts on object A, da 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 da. Mass of A is 840 grams, so that's 0.84 kilograms. I'm probably gonna to have to use kilograms in a second. Calculate for T zero to T four, the change in momentum of A. So from here, we can see the velocity goes from 4.2 to 8.8 .8, all the way up here. So the change in speed is gonna be 4.6 meters per second, times up by the mass to get the change in momentum. And that's 3.9 Newton seconds, or 3.9 kilogram meters per second. Force F, once again, we know that force is change of momentum over time. So that's gonna be 3.9 divided by the time taken. So that was four seconds. It's gonna be roughly one, but let's check what it actually is. 
0.98 newtons. C, the force is removed at time four seconds. Object A continues at a constant velocity, yada yada, collide. Right, we're talking about conservation of momentum here, aren't we? Object B is initially at rest, the mass of B is 730. Right, we can keep everything in grams, that's fine. By calculation, so the changes in momentum of A and B during the collision are equal and opposite. Okay, so if A ends up with 4.7 meters per second, delta MV equals the mass, its end velocity, take away its start velocity, V minus U, so let's just say that that is 840 times, and it was 8.8 .8, as we saw from the graph earlier, take away 4.7, gives us 3444. That's gonna be gram meters per second, but doesn't matter too much. What about B? It's going to be 730, and it's just gonna be times that 4.7, because it didn't have any momentum before, that gives us 3431. These are the same to two sig figs anyway, now we've proven that they have equal momentum. Technically, these should have been the other way around because I got my V and my U mixed up, so we should have ended up with technically a minus answer because it's losing that momentum. Two, explain how the answers obtained in one support Newton's third law, and that is to each action there is an equal and opposite reaction, that's force. Therefore, if F equals mv over t, delta mv and collision time are same for both, therefore force, forces are equal and opposite. By references to the speeds of a and b, explain whether the collision is elastic. Now because momentum is mv, but kinetic energy is half mv squared, that means that in order for both of those to be conserved, that's an elastic collision. Differences in speeds for the two objects before and after needs to be the same, but they're not. So we say it's inelastic as relative velocity of objects is not conserved. Define electric field strength force per unit charge. In symbol form, F over Q, Newton's per coulomb. Electron is accelerated from point A to point B by a uniform electric field. Yes, that's fine. Electric field lines show the direction of the force on a positive charge, so electron is going to go that way. Distance between A and B is 12 millimeters. Velocity of the electron is 2.5 kilometers per second, and at B is 18 megameters per second. Okay, I thought it was going fast before. I've never seen megameters before. What do you know? Calculate the acceleration of the electron. Okay, so let's write down our SUVAT variables. We know that S is 12 times 10 to the minus three meters. U is 2.5 times 10 to the three meters per second. V is 18 times 10 to the six meters per second. And we're looking for acceleration. We're gonna use V squared equals U squared plus two AS. So that means that A is equals to V squared minus U squared all over two S. So that means that we have 18 times 10 to the 6 squared minus 2.5 times 10 to the 3 squared. I think this is going to be negligible compared over 24 times 10 to the minus 3. That gives us 1.3, nearly 1.4, just not quite 1.3 times 10 to the 16 meters per second squared. What about the change in kinetic energy of the electron? Change in energy is gonna be half mv squared minus half mu squared, but we can factorize for half m. And we can do v squared minus u squared. So it's gonna be half times 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31. And then we put in uh, 18 times 10 to the six squared again, and that gives us 1.5 times 10 to the minus 16 joules. Find the electric field strength, so like we said, it's gonna be F over Q, where F equals MA, our charge of electron is gonna be E, that's 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31, times that acceleration that we found, 1.3 times 10 to the 16, divided by the charge of electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and that gives us 7.4 times 10 to the four. Mark scheme says 7.7, .7, but that's because they used the 1.35. They didn't use the rounded value. An alpha particle moves from A to B in the electric field, so it's gonna go left instead. 
Describe and explain how the change in kinetic energy of the alpha particle compares with that of the electron. Numerical values are not required. We know that the force is going to be double because it has two protons in. That's the equivalent of two electrons, just positive instead of negative. However, mass is roughly 8,000 times larger. So that means acceleration is roughly 4,000 times smaller. Finally, as EK equals half mv squared, therefore v squared decreases much more compared to m, ke reduced. Question four, spring is supported that it hangs vertically, different masses, yada yada. Stay and explain whether the spring obeys Hooke's law. Hooke's law is force is proportional to extension. X graph does not show directly proportional relationship. State the form of energy stored in the spring due to the addition of the masses. That's elastic potential energy. Can't just put elastic, we have to put elastic potential. Describe how to determine whether the extension of the spring is elastic. If spring returns to original length when load removed, elastic. And the last bit of this, calculate the work done on the spring as it is extended from 40 mil to 160 mil. So we're going from here all the way to here. So let's split this into a rectangle and a triangle. It's the area under the graph. So we have 120 times, well, what's this here? 70 plus, well, we're going from 70 all the way to 145, going to be 75 times that 120 again, divided by two. So that was grams, so we need to divide that by a thousand to turn it into kilograms. But in order to have the work done, we need this to be force. So it's gonna be 9.8. So that gives us one to six Newton millimeters. But to turn that into Newton meters, which is the same as joules, we need to divide by a thousand again. 0.126. Five, a diffraction grating is used to determine the wavelength of light. Describe the diffraction of light at a diffraction grating. We know that waves spread out as they pass through the slit. There you go, that's all we need. By reference to interference, explain the zero order maximum. It's all to do with path difference. Equals zero, therefore waves arrive in phase, constructive interference occurs. First order maximum, here we know the path difference between each adjacent wave or each wave from adjacent slits equals lambda, or wavelength. The fraction grating is used with different wavelengths of light, angle theta, whatever, whatever. Variation of wavelength lambda of sine theta is shown here. Okay, we're going to have to use this then. Determine the gradient of the line shown in figure 5.1. Okay, let's pick some nice numbers. Let's go from here to here. So the height is just 0 0.1 and the width of it is 375 to 500. So that's going to be 1, 2, 5 nanometers. So the gradient is going to be 0.1. However, we need the wavelength to be in meters. So it's going to be 125 times 10 to the minus 9, because that's nano, nona. That gives us 8 times 10 to the 5. Using the gradient determined in 1, calculate the slit separation D of the diffraction grating. Okay, so we know that this was for the second order. So n lambda equals d sine theta. But we've just found sine theta over lambda, and we're looking for d. So d is equals to n lambda over sine theta. This is one over the gradient, because we found sine theta over lambda. So this is gonna be n over the gradient. So it's gonna be two over eight times 10 to the five, and that gives us 2.5 times 10 to the minus six meters. On figure 5.1, sketch a line to show the results that would be attained for the first order maxima. We know that if n is halved, sine theta is going to half. So if sine theta halves, that means that we have a line where the gradient is half of this. 
So it should look something like that. Six, describe the IV characteristic of a metallic conductor at constant temperature. It's a straight line. The graph is always a straight line, regardless of whether it's IV or VI, it doesn't matter which way around, it's always a straight line. Straight line through the origin. We need that, i.e. directly proportional. What about a semiconductor diode? So it should look something like this. Current, and that's our PD. Putting that into words, we can say zero current in one direction, high resistance for EG negative PD. Sudden increase in I when V increases just above zero volts. Two identical filament lamps are connected in series and then in parallel to a battery of EMF 12 volts. Negligible internal resistance, good, we, so we can forget about that. So what have we been asked about this? Use the information shown in figure 6.2 to determine the current through the battery in the circuit of figure 6.1. So we know that the PD across each of these is gonna be six volts. So if there's six volts, then we know that on the graph, we're gonna have three there, that's gonna be 2.8. That's gonna be just 2.8, same for both. What about in this one here? Well, we know that that's gonna be 12 volts. So we're looking at a current of four amps. It's going the wrong way. We're looking at a current of four amps going through both. But that means that four amps going through there, four amps going through there, that means that we have eight amps going in. Calculate the total resistance of 6.1. A, R equals V over I. So that's just gonna be 12 over 2.8, 4.3 amps. And then in circuit B, 12 over eight, that's gonna be 1.5. Calculate the ratio, power dissipated in, a, in this lamp over this lamp here. So we're looking at this versus this. Now we know that they're going to have different resistances because we can see the resistance is changed. So we can't use I squared R or V squared over R. So we are gonna to have to use VI. So this is gonna be VI of the first lamp over the second one. It's gonna be six times 2.8 divided by 12 times four gives us 0.35. Finally, question seven, nice short one to finish off with. Following particles are used to describe the structure of an atom. Underline the fundamental particles in the above list. Electron, quark. Neutrons and protons are made of quarks. Following an equation represents the decay of cobalt 60 to form nucleus Q, yada, yada. Complete figure 7.1. So it's a beta particle. So that means that the overall mass is staying the same. We have a neutron turning into a proton, so that means Atomic number goes up by one, so we have 60, 28. Name of particle X, whenever we have an electron being given out, we need to have neutrino involved as well, but it's an anti-electron neutrino. Anti-neutrino would get you the mark. So there you go, that's it. If you want to have a look at paper four as well, click on the card and I'll see you there.